Welcome to the Head Traffic Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Maranaka. Today, we have a very special guest. I've known him for a while. His name is John Gilpin, a.k.a. Lex Lufa. He's a DJ and music producer and record label owner from Huddersfield, Yorkshire, England. Lex's illustrious career spans decades with releases under his own name, as well as a number of aliases. He's been on numerous tours, and he's founded a number of successful record labels, such as Red Robot, Fat as Fuck, as well as his current labels, Fet Recordings and LB Recordings. How are you doing, Lex? Thank you very much for taking your time out to do this uh, interview with me. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm doing very good, thanks. Thanks for asking. I wanted to start off by asking you, um, since you're a DJ and music producer, um, what kind of music are you listening to at the moment? Is there is there anything new that you're listening to, or do you mostly stick to, to older music? Um, with regards like the house scene, it's probably, this to a lot of producers like Harry Romero, um, Deep Shakers, uh, Chiquito, Sounds like that really, more, more on the tech house side of things, and Stanny Abram was a friend, obviously, he's a like his style. Um, as regards to other stuff, I have always listened to like the specials, bands oh, like okay. that, uh, uh, Massive Tack, Blues, quite a broad spectrum really as well, from Prince, you know, to Hendrix, I've always got their, their albums on the go at some point. Yeah, I, I feel like you probably get inspiration from everywhere, I'm sure. The specials is kind of uh, like punk music, isn't it? The specials is like, uh, it was a cross between, okay, it had a punk influence, but it was more like a ska kind of sound. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've only, this is really weird, but they had a song on that video game, Dance Dance Revolution, and that's the only song I've ever heard from them. And uh, yeah, it was. I remember it being ska. I don't know why I said punk. A punk vibe to them, though, but it was more ska. Gotcha. Yeah. Are they are they still around, or is is that just like they had a couple records a while ago and kind of disappeared? Well, they, they, I don't think they're making any new records, but they're still touring heavily in the, in the UK. They still do really well packed out. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, it's it's probably a nostalgia thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, people love, still love that old Scar sound from the two-tone days, definitely. And Massive Attack, I don't know why I never got too much into Massive Attack, but that's mostly, like, electronica, right? Would you say, like, kind of down-tempo, or...? Yeah, it's, it's, it's down-tempo electronica, basically. Um... Massive Attack, they've just been a huge influence to me over the years. Um, I, I love their albums. Um, I've been to see them live, and I just, I just get them completely. It just every, every, whenever I listen to one of their tracks, it just does something to me. I can't explain why. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of, I don't know, it vibes with you, I suppose. <laughs> Feel it basically. Yeah. Yeah, they they still make music though, right? They, I know they've been around a long time. Oh, yeah, they still make music. They've got a new album coming out soon, and they the tour heavily as well, yeah. Yeah, I saw you post something on Facebook, and I had to read it. I think it was Massive Attack that it said that um, one of the members of Massive Attack is supposedly Banksy. <laughs> you are, Robert Del Naggi, yeah. I mean, the, who knows? You will probably never find out. But, I mean, the, the, someone's put two or three together that whenever Massive Attack pieces come up, Massive Attack are always touring in that area when it happens. Like at the time when he when he did the, the the tag on the Palestinian wall, massive attack with touring in Palestine. Oh wow! Uh, and also, also Robert's a, a, a big artist, and all his art stencil based as well. Do you have an opinion on? I have to ask. Do you have an opinion on Banksy? Like, do you like his art, or do you follow him other than that? Um, I um, I used to be a big massive mass, a big fan of his. Um, I've got a few pieces on the, on my wall in the front room actually at home. Um, but I think it's kind of got really commercialized now and you, everybody's got the t-shirts and yeah. I don't know. It's kind of lost the meaning it had in the beginning. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you said that. I completely agree. That I feel the same way. Like now it's kind of, I don't know. Yeah, I guess commercialized would be the word. But yeah, no, I feel the same way. I mean, I mean, as long as people are still understanding his message, then I suppose that's a good thing. But yeah, it has got like, very commercialized. So, uh, currently with, with music production or just creativity in general, who would you say some of your biggest influences are besides Massive Attack? And I mean, not necessarily just musically, um, any, anything creatively, like movies or... Uh, well, uh, music, like I said, you've got Prince Hendrix, um, John Lee Hooker, uh, the, the early house pioneers, techno pioneers like Derek May, Juan Atkins, Marshall Jefferson. Um, also, I'm really inspired and influenced by, uh, politically as well, by a guy called Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, who was a Labour uh, candidate. 
I've never been inspired by politics in my life. <laughs> it's just something I've never been interested in, but this guy he really makes sense and he's inspiring me a lot lately. Just because he's got a positive vibe, cares about people and you don't usually find that in politics. That I wanted to ask you about that too because you've been kind of I saw that you post a lot of stuff about him on Facebook. I don't know if you followed the United States election, but would you say maybe in the United States you could compare him to like Bernie Sanders? Like that type of idea, I guess? Absolutely, yeah, totally. I mean he's been compared to Bernie Sanders quite a few times, yeah, definitely. He's that kind of that, that kind of person, yeah. I, w- I wanted to ask you too. So I, I I believe the elections are over, right? And he lost uh, Corbin. He did marginally, yeah. He did ma- lose marginally, yeah. So in the United States, you have to be a governor or have some kind of government position. It, he, I'm guessing, has some kind of government position that he would still be in, right? Oh yeah, he's still Labour of the Opposition Party, Labour Party, yeah. He oh, is. okay. So he he would still be politically active in some way. Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, he still makes votes in, in Parliament and things like that on issues. But, yeah, he, um, well, I mean, his popularity is growing, growing by the day. He just did uh, a speech at Glastonbury, I believe it or not, oh, you know, wow. the music, and everybody was cheering his name, the whole Glastonbury Festival. So I, I think one day he will be Prime Minister. Yeah, that that sounds like that'd be a positive thing for sure. That I wanted to ask you about that because Bernie Sanders was the potential Democratic Party candidate, and when he lost the bid to be the the Democratic candidate, I feel like support for him kind of just disappeared after that. I, it seems like Corbyn's kind of still around, and now Bernie Sanders, they don't talk about him so much over here in the United States. Well, I, th- I think that the spot for Jeremy Corbyn is growing. Actually, it's grown since the election very much. So he's he's you know, he's, he's a lot of the young people are, are coming out to vote for him, which in this country, the young people don't vote. Yeah, <laughs> they, they exactly. Vote. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that I feel like I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I think uh, Europe and um, well, the UK and the United States are kind of similar in that way. Um, no, young people don't really vote. But when Barack Obama was the candidate, that stirred up a lot of interest as well as these this past election, which was kind of ridiculous in the United States. I think a lot of people were out to support Bernie Sanders and then everyone everyone kind of lost it after that. But that's exciting for for you guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. These elections were a bit crazy for sure. You mentioned Glastonbury. Did did you follow that at all? Is do you know if it's over? Yeah, it was it was finished at the weekend. Like the weekend just gone. Yeah, I I saw a few videos of like a few artists. I saw a, a performance of Dizzy Rascal. I think, and I didn't really watch. Did you watch any of the artists perform or any of the videos that they posted? I haven't. No, I missed it this time. Um, I watched. I usually do watch. Get to catch it, but no, I didn't this time. I missed it. So you you had mentioned kind of a bunch of uh, tech house artists that you like currently. I wanted to ask you what you think of the current state of dance music. The past, gosh, ten years. The past couple decades, it's grown in popularity a lot, but it was already popular for for you guys in Europe and. I would say the past 10 years, the popularity has just skyrocketed in the United States. But that's um, obviously bred a lot of, I don't want to say hate, but I know I know you mostly follow the underground scene. But um, like in the United States, we hear mostly um, on the radio, it's mostly big room, uh, big room techno, what people call EDM. Uh, how do you feel about that? Like how the popularity has changed? How the sounds changed? I mean, everything progresses. Um, the the only thing I feel we've we've lost over the years is is the the scene had a structure uh-huh. where you'd have like your record shops. You'd go to your record shops on a weekend. You spend time with other DJs and friends, listening to music, picking what you wanted to buy. Um, then you'd have the club scene, and I think that structure of, of the scene has gone now. Oh, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I I honestly hadn't even thought about that at all. Uh, but but I mean I mean everything progresses whether whether you like what the way it's progressing or not. I mean that's just life, isn't it? Basically, but yeah, I mean I, th- I just think it's lost the, the structure and the scene it had. I mean I mean for re- I mean it's definitely a lot more mainstream these days. There's no uh-huh. doubt about it. But I mean uh, but again with with the invention of MP3, that necessarily doesn't mean you're selling more as what you did when it was really underground. You know what I mean? You're probably selling less now because there's so many uh-huh. people doing it. Yeah, it's it's a lot more accessible too with the internet, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, anybody can produce these days. It's from the home if they've got the right software, which anybody can get hold of, really. I mean, that's, uh-huh. like I said, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's good that people have that creative output. That's a great perspective. I, I totally feel the same way. I one thing that 
it's not happening so much anymore, but a lot of people, I think, were really bothered with the fact that um, there are new computer peripherals for producing as well as DJing. I know a lot of people who are more purists um, prefer vinyl or even the CDJs. And like, I guess how easy it is to be a DJ or producer, I know that bothered a lot of people. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I see on my Facebook constantly are people griping about the sync board and everything like that. But, I mean... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, I mean, to, to be a, a, a good DJ is a lot more than just matching beats and, and sync buttons. It's 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 a whole other world to, to me than that. Um, you know, it's uh, yeah, everybody has access to it, but surely not everybody can be a great DJ. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, definitely. It's it's all about the the vibes, definitely, right? I mean, there's some great DJs that I've heard that that don't even stick to a genre. I guess it's just the feeling that if you kind of are able to put your feeling and your passion into it, then people respond. I guess absolutely, yeah. It's 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 all what what you put into it. I mean, it's not it's not what you play. It's how you how you play and how you structure it. Definitely. Um, you had you kind of started. Um, the way I met you was on Club Vibes. Um, there was a number of internet radio shows. Um, are you still doing that? Do you still have any radio shows going on? At the moment, I'm not doing it on a regular basis, but I'm still doing like the occasional one-off mixes, just purely time-based. Really, I mean, I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it weekly again, but it's just finding the time now to to, to sit down and actually organize something like that. Where do you Where are you finding music? Do you usually look on Track Source, or do you mostly go through promos, or uh, both Track Source and promos? I mean, I prefer Track Source to Beatport. Um, Basically, they have a lot more underground stuff on Track Source, which I kind of like. But yeah, I do get quite a few promos, yeah. Yeah, I still get quite a few. So, getting back to the production side, you've been a producer for, what What would you say, like 20 years oh, or yeah, more than 25 that? 25 years, yeah. So, since you've been a producer for 25 years, you've seen the entire gamut of, like, recording to dats and tapes to digital. Do you remember your first production setup? Actually, yeah. I, uh, the first... We, I never had a setup to start with, um, basically because you needed so much gear in those days that I couldn't afford it. <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, so I used to hire a studio out but from a guy called Richard Brown, who was actually the, uh-huh. he was actually the uh, producer of Rhythm Invention, who released on Warp, Warp Records back in the day. Um, so we, I used to hire book it, book it for a weekend and go spend a couple of days in there every weekend. So that was probably like during the genesis of that label, right? Like they. They probably were just starting and maybe not even too popular yet, would you say? They were very popular in the UK from, from the day one, really. Um, they, they, everybody loved Warp in, in the early days. Uh, but yeah, he was one of the early... A lot of Warp artists used, used Richard for the productions. Um, he was a great engineer, basically. So when you would rent out those studios, what kind of equipment did they have there? Was it like drum machines and synthesizers? Uh, yeah, basically you had the Juno 106, 909, 808... Uh, three or three, um, things like that. Basically, a few. Um, not, not, not. Obviously, no software-based stuff in them days. It was all like, and it was uh, synced with Cubase. We used Cubase on an old Atari, I think it was. Yeah, it was, it was not. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I'm straight or something like. That. I can't even remember what it was, but it was really old, black and white screen. <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. I imagine it like the old like Commodore, like a video game, com- uh, the video game computer. Absolutely, yeah, it was like that, yeah. So how how was the the like recording structure? So you you would uh, probably create like a drum loop and synthesizer loops and just record it straight to tape. Uh, yeah, we recorded that live straight to dot. Yeah. Oh wow, that's really cool. I bet I'm sure the sound was completely different too as well. Right? Oh, it was a lot better. Plus, you could do like. Um, Live tweaks in the in the mix. Don't get me wrong. I you know you can do that these days, but it's much more fun to do it live with with your fingers. <laughs> Plus, too, there's kind of I wouldn't say like a fear, but almost some kind of creative spark you could just feel and just add like in the mix too. Absolutely, yeah. If you wanted to put, if you got like a lot of reverb or delay on one section of the track, you could just just twist the knob basically. And he, I once did a, a track that was totally live. The reverb and the delay was live completely through the track, all the way through with just tweaking the knobs. Songs were a lot longer too, right? And not necessarily. I mean, we used to do tracks that was eight, nine minutes long um, in the nineties, but now I think they're more like six, seven. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's what I meant. Like the ori- original house songs were. I feel like we're much longer. Was that because of vinyl record limitations, or was that just because that's how you wanted, how long you wanted to make the song? 
Oh, basically just how long you want to wait for the song. I mean, we used to have uh, intros and outros that DJs could use. I used to make sometimes we had a, like a vocal that would just be the outro and the vocal would just carry on for like a minute just so the DJ could mess with it at the end on the track. Oh, to mix into another song more easily? Sure, yeah. We used to do things like that regularly just for, for the DJ to mess with and, and play about with on the end. I think I've asked you this before, but do you have any of your old vinyl? I do. I have, I have all my old vinyl, yeah. I have a copy, copies of everything. Do you ever do you ever uh, go back and mix with vinyl, or do you, do you mostly just use uh, computer? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mess most of them just computer-based these days, yeah. So as far as production, what are you using now? Uh, basically, I just have uh, I've got a Axiom or M Audio Axiom A forty nine MIDI keyboard. Okay. Um, I use um, Reason and Cubase. Yeah, the process is a lot different, right? You, I don't use Reason or Cubase, but I, I believe you build your loops first and then kind of structure it that way, right? Yeah, the way I use it is I, I, I create all my loops in Reason, samples, uh, synths, and everything like that. I then uh, export them all as 8-bar loops into Cubase and then mess about with them in Cubase. For me, I've used Cubase since day one, like I said, when I said it was on a black and white screen, that, that was Cubase then. So I'm pretty old school with Cubase and I know it inside out, so I've always used Cubase. So when you when you first started, did you have like Cubase, like the first version? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how old I am. <laughs> how do you produce music? Do you usually go project by project or do you sometimes just sit down and kind of see what see what pops in your head? Um, usually it's project by project. So, I mean, sometimes I'll have a focused idea um, and I'll find all my samples, loops and everything I'm going to use for that idea first. Um, I mean, sometimes I can hear like I can be watching a movie, for instance, I can hear a sound uh-huh. and that sound will inspire me. It could be anything, a piece of machinery anything like and I'll work my track around that I'll find that sample use that sound tweak it to how I want it to sound and then build the loops and everything up around that sound um, but other times it's just straight from scratch and I might just start with a kick and just see how it goes uh-huh. it just depends really <clears throat> as far as like, finding finding inspiration through sound do you have any like uh, recent examples of songs that you created that way that people might be able to check out online as what well, that started with with an idea yeah you mean? exactly yeah I mean I've got an EP out now called it's my underground place EP um, there's a track on there called it's underground it's house music and basically, I started off with a little vocal sample that just says it's underground, it's house music. Uh-huh. And I built the whole track around that sample. So that, that's the kind of idea that, that I found the little sample first, and then that inspired me to build the track around it. Ah, okay. I'll definitely make sure to link that um, when we post this. Um, is there any projects that you're currently work on, uh, working on? Yeah, I'm currently working on a, a remix for Fett. It's a new Stephen Carr track that I've got coming out called Stars. Um... It's a, a techno track that he's done, but I, and I've just changed it up a bit. I thought, I thought, you know, it's called Stars, so I'm really into like sci-fi movies. I thought, uh-huh. you know, I could use that little line from what I say, you know. It's my God! It's full of stars. Yeah. So I'm going to use that in it. So that's you know the moment. I mean, I've got a few stuff coming out that I've just finished. I've got a couple of collaborations with Danny Abram. Uh, one's called For the Jackers coming on Marba. The other one's called Gunman coming on Fett. I've also done a collaboration with Groove Salvation. That's coming out on Connect pretty soon. Uh, I've got a few, a lot of things are always in the pipeline. I try to always keep things on the, on, on the up, coming out soon, hopefully. Uh, so as, as far your, as your labels, do you have any, any current plans? I know you uh, recently released um, compilations um, based on kind of the best tracks of some of the artists on FET, right? Uh, yeah, I've got some EPs coming out called uh, Showcase EP. She's going to be like three tracks that I think I think are the best releases from them artists. And basically, I've got they're coming out every week starting this uh, July. Uh, and just what I think that are my favorite tracks of them artists that are coming out on FET, basically. Um, so I wanted to ask you also: Do you have any other creative hobbies that you like to do besides um, create music? I'm, I'm a big big into scooters. I, I love my scooter. I ride my scooter all over the place. Uh, I'm also a big gamer. PlayStation. So I get a lot of inspiration. Do you have a PS4? I do, yeah. <laughs> I haven't um, been able to get one because where I live, they're like twice the price. But when I go to the next time I 
head to the States, I might get one. I, I saw there's a lot of new uh, Star Wars games coming out, right? Yeah, there's a Battlefield 2 coming out this year in uh, November, I think it is. Yeah, it's on my list, definitely. That one's mostly online, right? Uh, the original Battlefield was only online, but a lot of people complained, so the Battlefield 2 is going to have a story mode as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, I usually I usually prefer the, the story mode myself, but it, it's obviously always fun to play online. Do you, do you prefer it either way, or did you play the first Battlefield? I'll tell you, yeah, I've got the first Battlefield. I mean, I'm like you, I prefer the story mode. Um, I do like to play online, but um, the story mode is always my main interest, really. Uh, what other what other games do you like to play on PlayStation? Oh, uh, Call of Duty, Battlefield, uh, things like that. I mean, I love the old, some of the classics. I mean, I've not always had a PlayStation Um I've had Nintendos and Segas, you name it, through the years. But like, I've been going, like I've been going, I've been going a long time. I started with the Sega Mega Drives and Nintendo 64, things like that. But yeah, PlayStation's always been my favorite since PlayStation came out. Yeah, me too. There, uh, it's kind of weird. I think PlayStation is more powerful than Xbox, but they're re-releasing the Xbox One or something, and now it's like twice as powerful or something. But I don't know. I'm I'm still planning on getting a PlayStation myself. So maybe we could play Battlefield 2 one time when it comes out. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. To kind of wrap up the interview, I wanted to ask you what motivates you um, to keep creating music? Um, what's motivated you to keep doing it this whole time? And what advice would you give other people to keep them motivated? Um, what's, I mean, I've always just had an urge to do music. I mean, from when I was like... 20 when i when i first started out it was i was actually trained to be a chef oh wow um, <laughs> I, I went through college and everything like that i got all my, passed all my exams and i became a chef and then i got offered uh, a friday night on a pirate radio station and in the, like the 90s late 80s when it was pirate radio station was quite a big thing in the uk and I remember I asked my boss, can I have Friday nights off? And he kind of said, no way. Yeah. <laughs> so I jacked, I jacked my whole chef career in oh, <laughs> to play two, two hours on this pirate radio station on Friday night. So there's something always pulled me towards music. And I, I even like doing some, something major, jacking in my career just just to DJ two hours on a Friday night. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then I, got, I got offered some studio time around the same time. And since then, I've just been hooked. Uh, I've always been inspired to make music. I don't know why. It's probably like someone's similar, some, someone who's into artists who, who was always inspired to draw uh-huh. or create art. It's, it's the same kind of thing for me. Uh, sometimes, I mean, sometimes it is hard to stay motivated and, and do things like you do have lapses where you think, I've got no ideas at the moment. I um, can't really think of anything. But I think if you just take some time off now and again, the inspiration comes back. You could be watching a movie and you'll, like I said, like I said earlier, you'll hear a sound and you think, wow, I like that sound. Uh-huh. And that'll push you back. Just hearing it, hearing a certain sound might push you back into the studio and think, yeah, I'm going to build something around that. I've always thought the best way as well to stay motivated if, you, if you're into being creative is don't do it for anybody else. Do it for yourself. That makes sense. That's good advice. And probably it's good to take breaks every so often as well, right? To kind of recharge. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, in anything you in anything you do that's creative, you can lose your mojo now and again. Don't don't let it get you down. Just take that time out, do other things. And it'll it'll certainly come back. Well, thank you very much for taking your time out to do this. You could check out Lex's music on Fet Records and LB Recordings, and you have you have a number of other tracks coming out on other labels as well, correct? I do. Yeah, I've got a track coming out on Abracadabra. Uh, Royal Hour, Parezo, Stanley Abrams, Ectal Records, also on Break, Break label as well. I've got a track coming out on there soon. August, yeah, I think that's what yeah, August. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else that you want to plug? Uh, I don't think so. Just uh, check out Fet Recordings, basically, and all the artists we have on there. Yeah, Fet, Fet and LB, just have, have a listen to what we're doing. Thank you again so much for doing this, Lex. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for asking. Mm-hmm.